Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our guest is Paul Nussbaum, who we best describe as an explorer, who's going to tell us about the incredible trek he did fairly recently over the summer of the Pacific Coast Trail. But before I begin, Will, what's with your shirt this time? Oh, for my first shirt of, of 2020 is, is my Houston Texans shirt. I, I got it from Houston from Houston, Texas. It represents the Texans. They they are they are a, they are a great team and they they're playing this season and and I'm I, I'm supporting them. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Would you like to begin with a Paul now? Sure. Paul, can you start with a can you start with a recap of the background of this project and reasons for undertaking it? Well, uh, I <clears throat> well, the, the background, originally I started this project was, this is a, an, a, an, aut an autism advocacy project to raise awareness for, uh, for the issues and showcase the strengths of, of people on the autism mm -hmm. spectrum. And also, as it turned out, it was for my own uh, spiritual and development and my own, own personal growth. And it turns out that it's given me life, I mean, direction and life and clarity as to my life path. And interestingly enough, I'm still getting, still getting more insight from my experience after the cumulative 1,600 miles on the Pacific Crest Trail. 600 from 2019 and 1,000 from 2018. And spending those long months and going through the challenges of the, uh, the rigors of life on the, life on the trail. Have you done this hike so far in two stages? I have done this hike in two stages. Like I was mentioning, I did a thousand miles in 2018, was on the trail for four months, and covered the, the deserts starting from the northern part of the desert, it's 150 miles, and then the entire Sierra Nevada and mm. northern California up to Mount Shasta. This, the following year, in 2019, I did a 230-mile stretch from, from Mission Creek. I did Southern California, going over the mountains and through the deserts in Southern California. Ended up at Agua Dulce, or close to just south of Agua Dulce, and finished there for that section, and later in that year, I resumed at Mount Shasta and went to just north of Crater Lake, another 350-mile mm. stretch, and finished up the end of September, and I was going to continue, but the weather deteriorated, so I had to bail out, and fortunately, I bailed out just in the nick of time, mm. and there were other hikers that had to be rescued. Good grief. Is there, is there a next stage for the project? There is. And I'm looking at this year of uh, continuing where I left off in, in the southern, just north of Crater Lake, and continuing to, to the, going all the way, if everything goes well, continuing to the Canadian border, hopefully finishing the rest of the project. And then before that, doing another 100-mile stretch, closing the gap from where I left off in Southern California mm -hmm. to Tehachapi. Mm -hmm. And then later on, probably in that fall, doing the last 200 miles of that section and that in Southern California, and then finishing it. And oh yeah, there's a 20-mile stretch in up near the Sonora Pass in the Sierras. And actually, I even did part of that because I've hiked that before. So that's basically the plan. Thank you. So Paul, what uh, challenges did you face both getting the project organized and uh, more importantly, what challenges did you face in that incredible trek? Well, uh, the challenges, well first off, uh, conceptualizing the idea, but the big thing was organizing the logistics figuring out what equipment I was going to need. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest problem for me was the food strategy and also water strategy mm -hmm. when I was on the expedition and figuring that out, figuring out where I was going to resupply. 
and making sure that I didn't carry too much stuff, mm -hmm. make sure I didn't carry too much food, and make sure I didn't carry too much equipment. And I'm still working on that even after all this time. Mm -hmm. It's still, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, you, don't, you don't carry too much stuff. The less you can carry and get away with and utilize, mm -hmm. the better. Because then the lighter your pack will be, the more distance you'll be able to go, the less that you will burn yourself out. Interesting. Um, have you received any support from our com autism community? I have. Uh, I've, well, I've received a, a great deal of support from the Ascend organization mm -hmm. based here in San Francisco. And also I've received uh, support from the ascend to go opera organization mm -hmm. in Colorado. <laughs> and not only monetarily, but just in terms of uh, in, in terms of fan, fan support. Mm -hmm. And that meant a great deal of, for me. Just receiving a card when I was on the trail and I was covered in dust in the mm -hmm. desert, going through the desert, or I was, when I was going, just visualizing that card and visualizing everybody's support. Oh. And when I, was, when I had rain dripping off my head when I was going over one of the mountain passes in the Sierra Nevada. Excellent. Now, hopefully our, our viewers are familiar with Ascend, but uh, you're also involved, as you mentioned, with an organization called Ascendigo. Can you Correct. tell our viewers about that? Yes. What, what it is, is it, it's an autism uh, services organization, and it's based, in the, it's based in Carbondale, Colorado, which is in the Aspen mm -hmm. area of Colorado. And they are, they, they've grown now to a large provider of various types of autism services mm -hmm. like they have a summer camp which I which I've worked at and also they have a winners program where they teach ski lessons and not to mention providing various services and, and various types for all types of uh, all types of people on the autism spectrum at varying levels mm -hmm. And name and also they have a their namely one of the ones is employment pre pre preparedness and and contacts Excellent. and and living living skills life skills as well and I can go I can keep going on too we may excuse me <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about some of the the incredible from you know I've talked with you we've heard you speak before challenges that you you faced on the hike, particularly in this last leg? Well, in this last leg, interesting thing, I've been writing it down in my journal, mm -hmm. which I will use, which I'm going to use later on. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the big challenges was in the first part, going through Southern California, going through the heat, mm -hmm. was that I had to plan out my water skill, water strategy because I had to carry five liters of water, six liters of water up a 5,000 foot mountain, just to give you an example, in 100 degree heat. And water, and between 20 or 30 mile water st stretches where there was no water. Mm -hmm. So I had to really plan out carefully my water strategy. I mean, if I didn't do that, I could have ran out of water and I could have died, and which has happened to a number of people. That just, and that's one example. Another example would be hypothermia, mm -hmm. making sure my gear stays dry, my sleeping bag and my, <clears throat> and my clothing, for example, just keeping a pair of socks dry was a very big deal. And just keeping my stuff dry when it's, when you're having conti continuous days, several days of pouring rain, it's 40 something degrees out, and then you can't dry anything out. So it was crucial that I kept everything dry mm -hmm. and, and then warm myself up, not getting hypothermia, which is an unfortunate thing that happened to another hiker, which mm. was like 150 miles north of me, who had to be rescued out of the same area because all his stuff was wet and he would have died of hypothermia had he not been rescued. My goodness. So the, the strategies in both of those situations was very important, and this is just an example, and I can give more examples later on. Indeed, and didn't you mention to our group uh, that you were like caught in a really nasty lightning storm? I did. There were several 
to describe that there were several light there were several there were 80 lightning strikes that night i was camped on a ri exposed ridge there were bushes that were about two feet high there was a tree a lone pine tree which mm -hmm. is about 100 feet tall and then right next to it was a deadfall which is a dead pine tree tall mm -hmm. pine tree and that could have been struck by lightning and all i could do was sit there in that spot and just pray because there was no place for me to go and during that storm i couldn't hike out in the, this was in the middle of the night and so there were like as i mentioned there were like 80 lightning strikes that night and there was a hiker that came to me fires were started i forgot to mention from that lightning storm fortunately i was spared at that fortunately my life was spared mm -hmm. i just had to pray that night. Fortunately, I was spared. There was a hiker that I met in the morning and she was camping a half a mile from me mm -hmm. and she had a, a lightning strike about a hundred yards in front of her and she was freaked out, needless to say. Mm -hmm. And so I just tried to calm, so I calmed her down <laughs> and this was the next morning when we had a break in the storm. That, that's incredible. And needless to say, I didn't sleep very well that night. <laughs> and I sort of stumbled about three or four miles that day, made camp that afternoon. Then we had another storm. Fortunately, I was in a canyon at that point in pouring rain and in my tent. Good grief. That storm. was just one of the challenges that I faced on the trail. Well, thank you. Our book correspondent, Jennifer Brooks, will now be asking a question or two. Uh, thank you, Keith. Paul, I'd like to ask you about interactions that you had with other people on the trail and how you handled them, if you ever had any difficulty making those decisions like, is this person friendly? Are they a murderer? How should I approach this person? What should I say to them? Well, uh, that's a good question. Well, I, I did. I think part of that for me was following my inner sense because being on, being on the autism spectrum, I don't always see what people's intentions are. Yes. So I'm able to... Many of us have that challenge. So I'm able to look into my own inner, my own inner sense and that, to override the deficit for me. And that's, I found that to be really helpful. And there were... Most, for most part, most people were very, very friendly. I've had very good encounters. I've, I mean, I had one when I was at a particular rest stop in California where one that was questionable, and my instincts just told me just to leave, and I did. And I was just watched, just looking behind me to see if the person was following me, and fortunately that didn't happen. And I was just prepared to do whatever I had to to protect myself and also I had to override my own fears of the situation because my fears in that encounter were going crazy and then I had to look at and decipher the real situation from my own fears and that was a big learning experience for me on the trail not only in that situ particular negative social situation but just in survival in general on the trail and then I'm finding that I can apply those same strategies to life in general because as we know life has its challenging situations yes. just in a different form. Well I can understand you have another question or two. I do. What was your favorite part of the hike? For me my, my favorite part I think my for me the favorite part was just I think it was just the simple things when being, I think part of it was being able to, was having the, the spiritual aha moment. That was a big, and that connectedness to God or a higher power through the hike when I've, when I've overcome a particular, when I've overcome an obstacle. And I think also too, a part was meeting up with and connecting with the other hikers on the connect on the on the hike and also being able to just connect with commune with nature I was a big aha moment and it was just the simple things that I think were the favorite part 
for me. Mm -hmm. Nothing necessarily spectacular. Yeah, the simplest things could make a whole lot of difference too. It's like enjoy this moment before this huge like hike that I'm excited about, but I know I'm gonna be trafficking weather and dealing with that. I uh, exactly. so I'm, yeah. Yes, so obviously, <laughs> I mean, so we've talked about people who do hikes as well, and they do some you've probably met who do it for their own purposes and. Uh, do you, have you met others that follow in your footsteps that hike for autism empowerment? I haven't specifically on my hike, but there are people that do that. So I mean, you're the I think I'm Actually, I think I'm one of the originals. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but I'm sure there have, I mean, I don't know the answer for that for sure. But okay. I know, but so far from what I've seen, there aren't very many people that have done that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like I'm one of one of the originals okay well it's great that you're someone that does it for autism empowerment so um, and i'm proud to do that proud because to that, yeah. i mean not somebody's only got to. <laughs> somebody's got to but yeah. i mean also from my own experiences mm -hmm. of living on the autism spectrum yes which i've tried to sort of deny and fix for a number of years mm -hmm. wasn't able to take wasn't able to do it on that approach mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so i had to come to the point where I've had to embrace it. Sure, so, sure. And also, it gives me a lot of joy to be able to help other people that are going through that same struggles. Uh, yeah. I mean, so much so that the joy overpowers the struggles and the yes, challenges. Yes, exactly. Thank Excellent. Along those themes, uh, Paul, can you tell us a little bit more about how your life journey and your uh, being autistic has led you to this? Well, uh, for, for me, it's because of, because of the struggles, my life journey has led, has led me to coming to the realization, embracing and loving myself. Mm -hmm. I think that is a big one. Instead of trying to fit into the society's mold of what I should be, which I've never really been able to do. I think part of that's the Hollywood image mm -hmm. of society's mold of what I should be, and I could never achieve those standards. I think maybe we have, I think, I think a lot of people have that, but I mean, particularly struggling with the autism spectrum mm -hmm. and having the social disconnect issues, I've had to learn how to take another approach instead of trying to take the approach of trying to trying to push my way through that same glass, same door mm -hmm. that I couldn't get through, like trying to push a boulder up a hill. <laughs> or, so if I hear you, your work on the trail, your life experience has led you to say, you found out what your particular path in life is, which is right for you as opposed to trying to fit yourself into someone else's conception of what the right path is. Exactly. I learned that on the trail and doing these expeditions. It was a metaphor for that. And so now I'm learning how to apply it to life's challenges as well. And it's still a work in progress. Excellent. But at That's least a... now I'm gaining mm -hmm. the tools to do it. Mm. That's extremely powerful. Thank you. Well, do you have some final thoughts about uh, how you'll be going forward and about how the autism community may get involved and, and actually your involvement in the autism community? Okay. Well, uh, well, for me, uh, to get, getting in, for me, well, I've, I've been, in, been involved. I was, uh, um, well, I was d diagnosed on the, on the spectrum about, it's, uh, 20 something years ago and then I became 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 involved and I was one of the one of the founders of Ascend and which took which mm -hmm. took place in 1999 and I was diagnosed in 1997 and have completed a lot of projects from that time to now and from now going forward I would like to continue my continue my involvement one of the things is finishing up my doing the last part of my my trek, and I'm looking at doing that this year, that this season, finishing up the Pacific Crest Trail. And then also, I put on the back burner the Greenland Project, which was another advocacy project. 
and I still have that in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. And I needed to put that on the back burner because I didn't get the funding for it. I was training for that, and funding didn't come through. So I decided to do the Pacific Crest Trail as a plan B. And particularly getting to my, my involvement, I definitely want to continue my involvement. And one of the things that I want to, one of the goals I want to see happen is full, full inclusion for people on that full spectrum. And Could you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by full inclusion? Well, in, ter in terms of in full inclusion, I mean like, like opportunities for jobs, for education, uh, opportunities for a, for a full life. Mm -hmm. And then however that is defined. Excellent. And not being, and not being uh, shut out of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And then, finally, any words of advice for uh, our viewers on the spectrum? I think for me is just to follow, follow your visions. There are roadblocks, but just to keep, follow, keep following your visions. And, and I think getting in touch with, what's, with your, real, your real visions and what's really what's really possible and what your life goals or your life direction is finding out what your life direction is and pursuing it and running the race that's marked out for you <laughs> well excellent this has been very inspiring and empowering and we very glad to have you and we look forward to finding out and seeing what you do going forward so once again thank you very much Paul Nussbaum thank you and now we'll hear from our book correspondent Jennifer Brooks who has a couple of very timely offerings yes first I'd like to show you the official magazine of the Pacific Crest Trail Association this is a magazine they put out and I encourage everyone to join the Pacific Crest Trail Association and take a look at the magazine. And now I'm going to segue from a literal trail into a metaphorical trail and tell you about a book by Ellen Notbohm titled The Autism Trail Guide. And so this is a series of short essays, the closest that we have managed to come so far to a chicken soup for the soul of autism. And she discusses the challenges of raising her two children, Bryce, who is on the autism spectrum, and Connor, who has ADHD. And she talks about a variety of everyday struggles that almost every parent would be able to relate to, like helping your child with math homework or sending them off to summer camp for the first time. And even though just about every parent faces those challenges, at some point they are a little bit different when your child happens to be on the autism spectrum. And so most of the book is about how she approaches that. She also has some advice in general, such as, let's see. All right, so in this essay titled Seven Pillars of Wisdom, the seven pillars, seven lines of advice that she gives. Number one, live in the moment. Two, be a cliche. Three, don't be a cliche. Four, don't therapize your child. Five, look for increments rather than earthquakes. Six, recognize and reject futility. And seven, always have a plan B. Good advice for life in general, as well as for raising a child on the autism spectrum. Thank you. So today I'd like to share, uh, there's a Reminder about um, every Saturdays, there's a drum circle at the Pomeroy Center, um, who we've actually we've interviewed a couple people from the Pomeroy Center on Skyline Boulevard. And, but they 
notes, but to share, they have a drum circle every Saturday, and it's going to go all through, um, it's been going through for a while, but it's going to go all through February 2020. Um, no experience necessary, it's just uh, everybody, um, is they have access to a level of func functionality and skills in all ages, so uh, sounds very, uh, sounds like something that could be very, uh, very good. Um, the Autism Family Bay Area is a Facebook page that they have, so you can look that up sometime. Uh, next, uh, Saturday, February 8th, is KNBR Giants Fan Fest 2020 at Oracle Park, AT&T Park, 24 Willie Mays Plaza, uh, broadcasting on the field, Q&As, uh, free players autograph places to take photos, um, walk or play catch on the field and um, weather's permitting, of course. Um, Self-guided tours, kids, zones, and more. And lines will be, you get to meet popular players, but lines will be incredibly long, so prepare to be patient. And that'll be uh, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., February 8th. And lastly, um, it, all right, I have down to mark your calendars for the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit, which is a, uh, organizing their first neurodiversity friendly conference. Their theme is scaling up the neurodiversity at work initiative. You can go to the Ascend website to get more like details, but I pretty much have a lot more here than I was expecting to have. Um, registration is free. It will be opened on February 1st, 2020. And the preliminary schedule is available on the site. Go to med.stanford.edu and uh, you just look under neurodiversity or neurodivergent, you'll, you'll see the schedule there. But bringing together neurodiverse, divergent individuals, job seekers, employers, service agencies, education, educators and students, parents and professionals of all areas of the field and along with a job fair and a reversed job fair and planning with universal design in mind, maximize accessibility to inclusion. and. So it's supposed to be a comfortable uh, participation, and that is Saturday, March 14th, 2020, starting at 8 a.m. And uh, again, registration, February 1st. Thank you. Yeah, so to follow up on the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit, I'm on the committee that is helping to plan it. And if you're out there listening or watching this, and you're on the autism spectrum, and you're looking for a job, we really encourage and would welcome you to come to this. We're going to do everything we can to make it a comfortable and positive experience for you. Most of the employers will be in the technology field. We do have some that are non-tech oriented like EY, Ernst & Young, one of the big accounting firms. And yeah, what else? So registration will open on February 1st for job seekers on the autism spectrum because we want to, we really, really, really want to encourage as many of you out there as we can reach to come to this. And then later on, registration will open for associates such as parents and educators and professionals who work with adults and children on the autism spectrum. Thank you, Jennifer. Can you repeat uh, when and where it is located? Uh, yes, it's going to be Saturday, March 14th at the, I'm not sure exactly which building it is, somewhere in the engineering complex. I know Stanford is a huge sprawling campus, mm -hmm. so it can be difficult to find your way around. Yeah. But there, there are maps and there I'm are- I'm sure it'll be the map on the, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, other navigational aids. <laughs> well, folks, um, I want to thank you for watching this week's uh, program of Send TV, which, uh, if you ask me, has been a particularly powerful and meaningful program. And until next time, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Stacey Kennedy. And I'm Jennifer Brooks. <laughs>